Welcome to No Tourists Allowed, a podcast where two recognized travel industry executives with a combined 71 years on the inside of travel and technology give up their secrets to the thing everyone wants to do. Travel better, spend less, and see more of the world. Here are your hosts, Mike Putman and James Ferrara. Good day, everyone. I'm Mike Putman. And I'm James Ferrara. Mike, I think our total of years has gone up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I think that intro was maybe from a couple of years back. So we could probably. <laughs> so now probably. I think we're 71 years combined. The odd thing is somehow those extra two years are only, you know, you aging, not me. I don't know how that happened. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I've been at this a long time, and it feels like I've been at it 71 years. Uh, <laughs> well, welcome, everybody. Welcome to NoTouristAllowed.com. And uh, you've got Mike and I here today, and we've been musing on a couple of things, kind of ruminating and thinking and debating on a couple of issues in the travel industry, and that can affect you and uh, your fellow travelers and and the way you see the world. So, uh, you know, today's episode is really thoughtful, Mike. Yeah, absolutely. We've got a lot of news uh, to share with you guys and um, happy, happy to be back on the microphone, so to speak. So um, let's kick this off with a little bit of bad news, actually. Um, It's not really bad news, but historically bad news is there's a, a very famous hotel in Las Vegas that has been around for 71 years, um, speaking of 71, and uh, that hotel is the Tropicana, and it has announced that it will be closing uh, permanently, which is really unfortunate news. I've spent some time there, um, happened to know the uh, general manager there many years back, um, this is also one of the hotels that's in a James Bond movie. Uh, it's in the 1971 Diamonds Are Forever, where um, I think it was Sean Connery. I'm not sure, but I think Sean Connery was there, and he stayed in a in a suite um, there. So iconic, real iconic hotel on the Strip. And and are they going to do one of those Las Vegas implosions? Yeah, Mike, you know, they, where they blow this they, up. They have to. I, I um not sure, but uh one of the interesting things that that about this hotel is that it cost fifteen million dollars to build three hundred rooms that had two wings, right? So in, in the hotel building business, they call it keys, right? So this would be three hundred keys, which they call for rooms. But today in Vegas, it would cost you around a third of that to build one key, just to, to kind of put things in perspective. It costs so, you $15 million to stay for a week in Vegas right now. Yeah. <laughs> There's also, you know, back in the old original Vegas, uh, where there was a lot of mob activity and, uh, and so forth, like the Tropicana was, it was kind of a, um, uh, known for its mob ties. Um, they actually had a really cool mob museum there um, that that spoke a lot about its ties, and and I got to I got to experience that as well. So also known for the, one of the longest running acts in Vegas, Donnie and Marie uh, helmed the Tropicana from I don't know a decade or two uh, there. Donnie and Marie Osmond. So uh, you know that's what Las Vegas is losing. I guess we should take a minute to say um, that Las Vegas still has quite a bit left and and quite a lot of things to see. It's become, as we've talked about on earlier episodes, it's evolved through um, many different positionings in the world, and most recently now a sports capital of the world with uh, Formula One racing and with a new stadium that's going up where the Tropicana was right so that'll be a new baseball stadium and there's a football stadium there already and now this sphere this new um big entertainment venue so there's a lot new in las vegas there's also a lot authentic in las vegas and i think maybe that's a little odd 
to put those two terms together in the same sentence, Las Vegas and authentic. But there are things to do outside the hotels and even off the strip. So if you've been to Las Vegas a lot, you've probably done the hotels, you've seen a lot of that. It's fun to push beyond it and try to get a sense of another Las Vegas. One way to do that is to get out of town completely and go to like Red Rock Canyon or or Bryce or one of the nearby um, natural features around Las Vegas, which are stunningly beautiful. I mean, really worth a day trip. Um, another thing that I like to do is hunt for sort of the hidden Las Vegas. So I've told you before, one of my favorite restaurants in Las Vegas is a place called Lotus of Siam. And it's actually located in a strip mall uh, off the Las Vegas Strip. Uh, but it's where a lot of the famous chefs who have restaurants in Las Vegas and their teams go to eat late at night. It's a very authentic, huge, almost cafeteria-style restaurant. Uh, they say the most authentic Thai food in the United States. So it's a famous place, but it's not glitzy and it's not on the strip. And that's just one example of like the kinds of things you can find and do if you push beyond the normal tourist stuff in Las Vegas. But there's a lot of tourist stuff in Vegas, for sure. Um, there is. A lot of new buildings, a lot of uh, new properties, and um, it's a, a great place to visit for a couple of days. But yeah, sad to see the Tropicana go. Um, one other thing I wanted to share a little bit about um, is uh, business class airfare sale. So uh, from time to time, and I've, I've shared this, I think once before, something similar, um, the airlines will drop, and I mean dramatically drop, uh, prices of business class tickets to different parts of the world. So Right now, there is a what we call a buying event where you can buy airfares. And let me just kind of put this in context. Typically, a, a round trip business class ticket from the East Coast to Europe is about $8,000. Sometimes it's $12,000, but it's around $8,000 is kind of the norm. Well, right now, there is, if, if you can go to the right place and travel at the right time, there are airfares, uh, including taxes, as low as $2,500 for business class. So that's less than coach tickets um, in a lot of instances. And the really interesting thing is, of that, when you, when you look at that, that ticket, so I'm talking about one from New York to Barcelona, as an example, $2,540. The makeup of that ticket is an airfare of $500, by the way. And the rest are taxes and fuel surcharges and, you know, customs fee, APHIS fee. There's all these fees that are applied to tickets that really run the price up. But at any rate, if you are interested in going to, um, I'm going to talk about Europe first, um, to Europe, there's some key cities and you have to kind of know how to work the system to be able to get to get these rates. So um, let me just give you some ideas of kind of the, the inexpensive destinations to fly into right now are Barcelona, Helsinki, Rome, Seville. James, you and I were, were in Seville not uh, uh, last year or a year before. Madrid, Lisbon, and Milan. So even if you aren't, if, if you're traveling to Europe and even if you aren't going to one of those cities, it might make sense if you want to go business class and you want to lay, you know, travel in style and a lay flat seat with gourmet meals. Um, it might make sense to fly. And this is what I do often. I'll fly into one of these cities where it might not be that I'm going and then find a train or an inexpensive um, uh, low cost carrier flight from wherever I fly into to, to my destination. Um, so a little bit about these airfares. Um, again, they're, they're from 2,500 up to probably 3,500. And these are for travel 
uh, in August uh, through November, typically. So kind of the tail end of their uh, peak season. Um, and you need to fly from a major city. So like I live in, in Greenville, South Carolina, and I might not be able to get this flight out of Greenville, but I can get it out, can get a discount if I go out of New York or Washington, maybe even Charlotte or Atlanta, places like that. So you might have to Uber there or, or pick up another one-way flight. Um, but it's a great, it's, it's a great way to save a lot of money um, and um, really, really travel in style. Um, so these, these fares, just a couple of other rules um, that you have to purchase the ticket somewhere between 30 and 150 days in advance, just depending upon where you're going. Um, you have to be able to stay a minimum of 14 days. And the inventory has to be an I-Class, um, and this is on American Airlines or Air France, as an example, or Delta. Um, and you have to depart and return on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So anyhow, have some fun with this, guys. If you're thinking about going to Europe, this is a, a, an opportunity to save a lot of money. Um, you do It does require some advanced planning, and you might have to do something you wouldn't normally do, like travel on a Tuesday when you want to travel on a Monday. But for some big savings, um, it is a, it's a great way to go. And, and I always say, you know, work with a professional travel advisor, right, for this kind of stuff, because they're keeping an eye on those sales. They're keeping an eye on those requirements. Um, the famous Michael White from Hickory Travel just scored me uh, first class tickets on Copa Airlines to hit a few. Uh, events that we have to do, Mike, in the Caribbean and Punta Cana in in uh, Cancun and so on. And uh, he just scored me a big first class sale from Copa Airlines. So, you know, go to your travel professional guys, whoever, it doesn't matter who it is, um, but uh, somebody who's got their fingers on the pulse of this kind of stuff. It's a lot for you to try to keep a uh, abreast of yourself yeah and just let me just let me top this off too because there's also another opportunity and um with pricing a little bit higher maybe another add another five hundred dollars seven hundred dollars but to get the same type of deal to delhi india uh new delhi johannesburg and nairobi so these are three other that are um Great deals, prices as low as seventeen hundred dollars plus taxes, which would be around, you know, twenty eight hundred, twenty nine hundred. And these are on airlines like Etihad, United, which I'm not a big fan of, Turkish, and Qatar Air France. Uh, and this is for travel September or later. So um, a little advanced planning, and uh, and and those flights like going to Delhi. I go to I go to India maybe once a year. It is a very, very long flight. Yeah. Um, it's uh, going in business really, really is good for your body if you're going to be on a plane for, you know, basically 20 hours or so. Yeah, I agree with that completely. I had to come back on the red eye from Portland last week, as you know, Mike, and it, um, you know, just made all the difference in the world to upgrade to first class. At least I got to sleep. Uh, and I wasn't sleeping standing up the way <laughs> you sleep in economy. Uh, speaking of which, I had quite an odyssey the last couple of weeks, and we haven't had the opportunity to talk about it. And that was exploring a market that might be new for um, our listeners here. We often talk about cruising, of course, ocean cruising. And then sometimes we remember to talk about river cruising, which is incredibly popular in Europe, in China, in Egypt, places like that, um, particularly in Europe. And so we talk a bit about that. But I think um, what we haven't talked about here before is domestic river, river cruising here in the United States. And there are only two or three real um, cruise lines to consider. Uh, when you consider the opportunities to cruise in the United States. And in the last couple of weeks, I was involved with an investment uh, opportunity with 
a company called American Queen. It used to be called American Queen Steamship Company. And before that, some of you might remember Majestic Cruise Lines. Before that, Delta Queen. They were all basically the same operation. Um, and the American Queen herself is the name of their lead ship. And that ship is the largest authentic steam paddle wheeler ever built and probably ever to be built in the world. It carries over 450 passengers. Uh, I got the op opportunity to go visit her, to walk her, to walk her three sister ships. So there was the Queen, then there's the American uh, Duchess, the American Countess, uh, and then finally the American Empress the first three are on the Mississippi and the Ohio rivers, and they do these great, like, Mark Twain-like uh, river cruises, you know? And they call at New Orleans and Natchez and the great Civil War uh, battery, uh, battle location in Vicksburg and like that. But then the Ohio River goes off into the Midwest of the United States and does itineraries like um, the Bourbon Trail, visiting bourbon distilleries. And uh, the Empress is actually up on the Columbia and Snake Rivers in the Pacific Northwest. So I flew up to Portland, Oregon, to go on board. And that ship does, you know, great winery tours and natural beauty tours through the Columbia River Valley and the Snake River Valley. So um, it's just not something that I think a lot of travelers are aware of. Uh, the sad news is that the company ceased operations. And the reason why I was visiting was to see if we would make an investment to try to bring the company back. It has a 40 or 50 year history in the United States. Uh, we decided not to go through with that investment, but someone else did. And um, that those cruise opportunities will be available again in the United States. And I don't know, it's such a celebratory Americana history um, kind of experience. And having gone on the ships, I was struck with how beautiful they are. I mean, it really is a luxury experience. Incredible onboard dining rooms and theaters and, and what they call saloons, which are like lobbies or big um, public areas. A chart room where you can learn from the onboard river Lorian who tells you the stories of the river. Uh, it's a slow-moving, very intimate experience like all river cruise. Mike, you were on a European river cruise uh, last year. Um, so I, I just think, it, you know, even though I was looking at investments, to me, it was a real eye opener about this whole other kind of travel that maybe we don't think about so often. Yeah, it was quite, quite popular years ago. And, uh, and I can certainly see a place of it in the American tourism economy. Um, especially for, um, you know, small groups and things that, that it, it's, a, it's president's club groups and things, people that want to do something a little bit different off the beaten path. That's a, a great opportunity. I had one other, uh, a couple other special deals I want to talk about um, as we've got kind of some, as, as we go into the peak travel season for a lot of families, um, I did want to share out something. So Club Med, which is James and is one of our favorite brands to work with. Uh, a lot of good people at Club Med. Just a really interesting story about how that company got started. Um, but they are offering right now a 50% off discount. Um, so kind of keep that in mind. It's 50% off the regular rates, and it's good for travel between April 27th and November 1st. Um, it's good for Club Med resorts in Mexico and the Caribbean and Canada. And for those of you who don't know, um, Club Med is all inclusive, it includes all the dining, includes um, alcoholic and non-alcoholic drinks, 
Um, and it's very family, family friendly. Most are, most of the club meds are, and they're even offering a second kind of incentive is that, um, with two paying adults, one child under the age of 16 goes free, right? So, um, you, you know, you're getting half off for you and your spouse or partner, and then you get one child under the age of 16 that goes at no cost, which is a really good deal. Also, if you are a single, um, typically when a single goes on vacation, they have to pay for the room themselves. If they're buying a travel package, you know, that entire cost of that room goes to them and it's basically double the price. Um, they're offering no single supplement uh, for solo travelers. So if you're going by yourself, um, there'll probably be a lot of singles at these club meds with this special, special pricing that's, um, that's in place. And um, it's a it's a heck of a deal. Just to give you a little bit of sample pricing, um, and again, now this is all inclusive, right? Uh, pricing: the Club Med Punta Cana in Dominican Republic is one hundred and sixty two dollars per adult per night, which it's normally four hundred dollars. The Club Med in Cancun one hundred and sixty two dollars. The Club Med in uh, Esmeralda in Dominican Republic is one ninety nine per adult. And that's uh, normally four eighty nine. So um, you got to book soon. This this offer expires uh, April eighth. So hopefully you're listening to this podcast before then. Um, but call your travel counselor and uh, your travel advisor and let them help you with this and book a fantastic uh, uh, vacation and uh, at a heck of a price. Absolutely, and that's the granddaddy of all-inclusive resorts, right? I mean, Club Med was doing it before anybody was doing it. Yeah, they were the first. Um, and, and I've taken my family. It's a really, really enjoyable experience, too. Um, it's it's very casual. You know, people want to just really chill out and enjoy um, enjoy the outdoors and the setting. It's not dressy. Uh, it's very European laid back. A lot of Europeans there. It's an interesting place. Yeah, a lot of fun, a lot of um, camaraderie. Uh, they they've got their own special vibe at Club Meds. Yeah, for sure. Um, and just speaking of deals, I got one other one, and I know James has got something he wants to cover too. But one last one. This is a really interesting deal. Um, so Alaska, James, you've been on Alaska cruise, right? I have been. Yeah, I was on Celebrity in Alaska. I I, I went years ago. And uh, it was one of the most spectacular visual things I've ever encountered. I mean, it's kind of like going to see the Grand Canyon the first time, except you got days and days of seeing these wonderful sights. Well, Holland American is offering a great, great deal. Um, this is a nine-night vacation, and it uh, includes a seven-night cruise on the Nui Amsterdam or Nordam. All right, so it's a seven-night cruise. And then you get one night hotel in Fairbanks. You get one night of hotel in Denali. And then there is a um, $125 onboard um, credit per room, not per person, but per room. And then you also get a $400 airfare credit per person. And then there is motor coat transportation between Fairbanks and Denali. So um, this is a, a, a fantastic deal. And this runs through the summer. Um, some of the departures are nine ninety nine. Others are eleven ninety nine. Now this would be for the least expensive inside cabin, and you can upgrade. But the discounts are accordingly applied. But it is a heck of a sale. And um, again, if you've never been to uh, Alaska, doing a cruise is the best way of doing it for your first time, for sure. Um, but you can get a couple of extra days, extra nights, and um, land transportation on a motor coach. And then also um, you'll get a, a domed rail transportation from Denali to Whittier. So great deal. These are departures uh, every week from May through August. Um, you know, definitely hop on this one if you get a chance. So it's just tell your travel account, travel counselor. Uh, it's the Holland American Alaska non-night sailings. One of my favorite cruises ever, you know, just really spectacular to look at everything, really cool ports to visit, 
And of course, if you're on a great ship like that, like Holland American Line, um, who who pretty much they were one of the originals, right? Princess and Holland American Line are often equated with um, the Alaska Cruise Voyage. Uh, the food's going to be terrific because that's the thing. Like if you're traveling on your own in Alaska, trying to see Alaska without a cruise ship, is very very difficult to get around from from port to port or from town to town. The hotels and restaurants difficult to find good ones, you know, so the fact that you've got your ship, you've got your food and your accommodations with you, in other words, uh, really does make it much easier to visit that part of the world. Um, but I loved it. Yeah. And you're packing and unpacking one time. I mean, a little bit difference with this because there's two nights on land, but you're, uh, th the distances in Alaska are great if you have to use the roadway system. So going by and, sea. And there, some places are not connected by roads. You drive a mile outside the town and the road just stops, right? There is no, there is no connection. Um, anyhow, yeah, great, great offer. Thank you, Mike. I have to tell you, I took my kids uh, when they were younger and um, we took a day excursion. And this is, you know, we, we ask our cruise executive to come, come on, what's their favorite cruise excursion? And this is, is mine, is um, we took a little skiff and I forgot which port town we were in but um just a little skiffed out and we went fishing and in a matter of about two and a half hours we caught uh, about 175 pounds of fish and that it was just like <laughs> a guy, a guy, like a young guy and he said what do you want to catch I go, well, what can we catch and he said well halibut salmon this kind of salmon that kind of salmon and we would fish different techniques all in this time so we caught like tons of halibut and and king salmon and um, some sockeye, I believe, was the other kind, but it was a great experience. And just I did go see the salmon runs, you know, the salmon sort of spawning up the river, and saw whales, and saw bears, and seals, and I mean, it, it was really, uh, really great. Um, so the other thing that I wanted to talk about is a a different type of travel. Here we are in the uh. What century is this, Mike? The 20, 21st century? Is that what we're in? Yeah. Here we are in the 21st century. And, and travel means things, uh, new things, things it didn't mean before. And, and the one that's really kind of edgy is uh, this concept of virtual reality and augmented reality. Heard a lot about this for 10 years, probably, and seen the development. And there was a recent Harris poll, I just read it yesterday, about the development of virtual reality and the increase in the number of people using it. And you might guess that the people use it, use it largely for gaming. And, and you would be right, but you'd be surprised how close a second there is to gaming. 51% of users use virtual reality for gaming. 47% use it to simulate travel experiences. That is really interesting to me. Um, and of course, the usage decreases with age, as you would expect. So uh, Gen Z are the largest users. And then you, as you back up through, uh, Gen X and boomers, they use it less and less. But the surveys say that they're the most interested in trying it. So I think, you know, even these older generations, and I count myself amongst them, um, you should. Yeah, you should. <laughs> just barely, even they are thinking about how they can use it. And the idea that, that people might be able to use technology in some sense to experience travel is is really kind of interesting because does that mean i mean here we are at no tourists allowed and we're all about traveling more authentically and having more memorable travels and so on and now this technology comes along that says maybe you can travel without leaving your couch and i don't know how i feel about that is that a good thing 
or a bad thing? Does that undercut our message here at Notorious Aloud? Or maybe does it support it? Does it become the portal for people to travel? Do they sort of try out places at home? Maybe people who are uh, uh, a little trepidatious about going on a cruise um, might do a virtual reality experience on a cruise ship, and then that leads them to actually book the cruise. Or they check out some exotic location, and that leads them to actually book a trip there. Or is it the other way around, and does it defeat people actually traveling? Yeah, it's so. I'm going to back out the virtual reality part because I think that's a that's a segment of this. But I do think that this virtual. When I say that, I mean the you know putting the goofy headset on. Yeah, like I, I don't have anything to do with that. I mean, I, I don't know. It's just never <laughs> never been interesting to me. But the idea, the same idea, but instead of looking through a goofy headset, you're looking at a TV screen or a computer monitor or what have you. Um, really makes sense. Um, and I'll tell you, um, there, there's, uh, oh gosh, what is Susan's last name? There's, um, you mean Perillo? Cause you know, the, the famous Italian tour company, yeah. Perillo tours has a virtual reality company that they own also. I thought that's what you were referring to. Uh, it might be, I, th- it's going to come to me in a minute, but at, at any rate, it doesn't matter. But what this company does, and it might be the same one that's owned by the Prillo family, um, is they actually hire a local person and they they go through and vet these local tours, tour guides, um, like in London and Paris and all over the world. And what these guys do is they strap a um, GoPro on their head or their chest and they walk through the town doing a live tour. And she said it was really, and so I was asking her about scale and these other things. And she said, it's really important that they do it live because the the tour guide is interactive and he's got a headset on and he can interact with the users. So, you know, it's at five o'clock on Tuesday, we're going to do a tour of Paris and, you know, whatever. And, um, and so it's, it's really interactive. And, um, and so I was thinking like, that's kind of cool. And then she said, but you know, think about a, a classroom, you're in wor- a world history class, you're in 10th grade, and you get a chance to go through the Louvre or, um, you know, you, you do one of these tours. And I thought, man, now that would be really exciting for a kid who is hungry on history or it could be art or what have you. Um, so, so there's definitely a market for that. And then the other thing she said is that for um, senior homes, um, that there, there is a big marketplace for that because these people can't travel anymore or it would be difficult for them to travel, but they still want to have the experience. So I'm, I'm really behind it. I, I don't think it takes away from anything. And I think it probably is drives interest just like the travel channel when it, when the travel channel is, didn't used to have ghost stories on all the time. I think the travel channel really did build demand um, and got people aware of things that, that they might not have been. And, and so, look, I'm a, definitely a strong proponent of these virtual tools. I'm with you. The, the senior idea is a really nice idea, by the way. But in, in general, um, the, the poll said that two-thirds of Americans either use virtual reality or are thinking about, you, you know, considering using virtual reality. And I think that that's good news. I think it's good news for the future. I think you're right. This becomes a uh, inspiration to travel for a lot of people, and then maybe a way to travel for some people who aren't able to travel. Whether it's the seniors, or maybe because of some uh, uh, physical condition. Yeah, maybe they can't afford it right now. Yeah, or even can't afford it right now. That's right. Um, so anyway, little peek into the future. Give it a try if you uh, uh, have an opportunity to get yourself the goofy glasses and uh, and give it a try. Let us know what you think about it. Mike, we have a drawing going on. We haven't mentioned yet so far this episode, and that's for an exciting vacation for two, including air and uh, hotel accommodations at a resort and so on. And uh, all you have to do to enter into our drawing 
dear listener, is go to our website at notouristallowed.com. And I think the current activity is to sign up for our newsletter. And if you do that, you get five entries into our drawing. Each episode or two will come up with a new way for you to get multiple entries in the drawing. And then towards the beginning of the summer, we are going to draw our lucky winner. Just like we gave away a Virgin Voyages cruise last summer for two, luxury cruise for two, we're giving away this great vacation package for two also. Yes, absolutely. And that that uh, Virgin Voyage was like a $6,000 package. So that'll give you guys ideas of uh, what we've got up our sleeve for you. So That's right. We're not messing around here at No Tourists no. Allowed. <laughs> no, not at all. Well, listen, everyone, thank you so much for tuning in today. Uh, it's been a pleasure speaking with you again uh, a few days after Easter. And um, I hope you continue to tune in and register for our drawing, as well as share um, share the good word about No Tourist Allowed. Also, we, we haven't spoken about this before, but if you do like us or you do like the podcast, you don't have to like us personally, but if you like the podcast, Please leave us a review. I mean, uh, Apple reviews are great to have for the for us. It would help us out a lot if you would do that. So take a minute or Spotify, two. Spotify, Spotify reviews, yeah, all those help out because we want to spread the word and about send us to, a note. Yeah, uh, do that as well. We want to spread the word about how to travel authentically and uh, and and really be a good traveler and not a tourist um, through your travels. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye.